Welcome to the Zoom presentation series organized by the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome. My name is John Legge, and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Madeline Weld, who will be giving today's presentation. Madeline's post-secondary education was in the biological sciences, and she ended her career with Health Canada. She became aware of the issue of population at an early age as a result of seeing the poverty in developing countries to which her father, who worked in the Foreign Service, was posted. Dr. Madeline Weld will speak to us today as president of the Population Institute of Canada. After Madeline's talk, I'll direct a question and answer period and will call upon those of you in order of your notice to me in the chat function of the Zoom screen. But before I pass the microphone to Madeline, here's a quick comment about the title she has given to her talk. In the email you received inviting you to this talk, Madeline commented on the contradiction between the Canadian government's promises to take pro-environment measures and its actions to massively increase our immigration levels. This contradiction is very much connected to why Dr. Weld has named her talk, Green Growth, the Mantra of Our Cognitive Dissonance. I now pass the floor to Madeline Weld, who will speak to us on that subject. Madeline, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, John. Yes, um, as John said, no, my slide is not advancing. I'm trying to uh, advance my slide, but for some reason it's not. Oh, what, what about this? There we go. Um, as John said, the uh, title of my presentation is Green Growth, the Mantra of Our Cognitive Dissonance. And In a nutshell, what this cognitive dissonance is about is that on the one hand, we're told that Canada must cut back on its greenhouse gas emissions, reduce its energy consumption, reduce its waste production, conserve biodiversity, make its cities greener, and so on. And on the other hand, we're told that Canada must keep growing its economy and as an integral part of that, must keep growing its population while also preventing its cities from sprawling. And that just gives my brain a twist. I don't know about you, but that sounds like contradictory, uh, contradictory <laughs> agendas. And in my talk, I'm also going to be looking at, is there perhaps an agenda behind this cognitive dissonance? dissonance? So um, Trudeau announced his climate plan towards the end of March and it involves reducing emissions from the oil and gas sector by 42% from the 2005 levels in order to meet a 2030 target. He promises an additional 9.1 billion Canadian to take climate action, mandates at least 20% of light duty vehicles by, for sale by 2026 have to have zero emissions. And of course, blames Trump because why not? Uh, says four years of US uh, climate skepticism has held Canada back. So the Trudeau's population plan, on the other hand, <laughs> announced in February. Now, he didn't call it a population plan. It's a uh, immigration minister, Sean Fraser, talked about targets, and the targets for 22, 23, and 24 are all in the 400,000 from 431 to 451,000. Um, when you add those numbers up, they come to over 1.3 million additional climate changers by the end of 2024. And if you apply those numbers to the next two sets of three years, 25 to 27 and 28 to 30, you'd get very close to 4 million more climate changers by the end of 2030. And it would actually probably be over 4 million because they actually intend to increase the number of newcomers every year. Previously, in November of 2017, the immigration minister at the time, Ahmed Hussein, had announced a new normal of high immigration, which was um, 300,000 with a target of 340,000 by 2020. Before Trudeau, levels were already high at about 250,000 annually, 
And that high level started in 1990 with um, Brian Mulroney's government when his immigration minister, Barbara McDougall, agitated successfully for much higher immigration, which she said at the time could increase votes for the Conservative Party. I don't know that anybody would be so direct now, but that is actually what she said. So reality check on the climate plan. In 2019, Canada's total GHG emissions were about 730 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Oil and gas were 26% of those emissions. Canada is the only group of seven countries whose emission rose between 2015 and 2019, when Trudeau was actually prime minister. A Royal Bank of Canada report from 2021 says it will cost $2 trillion Canadian dollars to get to net zero over the next three decades. And in actual fact, US percent growth in total emissions under Trump between 2016 and 2019 was less at 0.6% than growth in Canada's emissions under Trudeau, which were 3.4. Now, the reason we stop at 2019 is because 2020 was kind of a, an exceptional year being shut, the world was kind of shut down with COVID. Whoops, did I, um, oop, there we are, sorry about that. So questions, how net zero is net zero? I mean, that's what we're allegedly heading for, but are we in sufficiently accounting for the environmental impact of say electric cars when you factor in the mining of components, the use of electricity for charging and the disposal of battery. I, I saw a video, one of those short videos where this woman at some event was, you know, praising the electric cars that they were using. And then somebody asked them, where was the electricity coming from? It turns out it was coming from coal. So there is that aspect. And then the question, why was the increase, um, percent increase in US emissions less than Canada's? And that's because Trump had cut back on immigration. So the percent increase in the US population was smaller than Canada's. And if, you, if humans are in fact driving climate change and Canada is among the highest per capita emitters, um, why are we striving to increase the number of capitas in Canada? Because based on its climate and distances, um, Canada is kind of stuck as being among the highest emitters in the world. So what is the actual impact of Canada's population growth on greenhouse gas emissions? Between 2019, 20, sorry, between 1990 and 2019, Canada's population grew by close to 10 million. And again, I'm using 2019 because 2020 was an exceptional year. So in that time, its annual greenhouse gas emissions increased by about 138 um, megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Its per capita emissions actually decreased a bit by about two tons, according to the data I was using from the first two links on this slide. Um, but we, so the increase in total emissions was due to population growth but we are deliberately driving up our population through immigration. Again, the green agenda is contradicted by the population agenda. The average newcomer to Canada increases greenhouse gas emissions by a factor of four, according to calculations that John Meyer made for 2015, and which actually match those of a published US study um, in 2008, which is the third link on the slide. So I think we skipped a slide here. Yeah, is there anything that matters other than climate change? That doesn't seem to be a question that is asked much, but what about farmland and food production, water uses, what about wildlife habitat, biodiversity loss, urban sprawl, and city infrastructure, um, pollution, congestion, housing affordability, social services, including healthcare? Population growth um, is either the underlying cause or exacerbates all of those problems. Uh, farmland. So uh, over half of Canada's best class one farmland is located in Southern Ontario where the greater Toronto area megalopolis is located. Only 5% of it was of Ontario's land was suitable for farming ever. 18% of that farmland has been lost in the last 40 years, and that is actually 
from some years ago. So it'll be well over 20% of Ontario farmland that has been lost by now, most likely. The latest data from the Ontario um, Federation of Agriculture says that Ontario is losing 319 acres of farmland each day. For every million people we add, we lose 530 square kilometers of prime farmland. And then this is a bit of a digression, but I'm including it to, because I, I think it kind of reveals the, the government attitude towards farmers and keeping farms in the family. So last year, a conservative um, member from Manitoba, Larry McGuire, uh, put forward a private member's bill, which was intended to make it easier for a farmer to sell a farm to a family member, such as a child or a grandchild of his, by excluding a, such a sale from anti-tax, or, or sorry, anti-avoidance tax rules. So instead of being um, taxed at the dividend rate of 48 per, over 48 percent, a sale such a sale of a farm would now be taxed at a capital gains rate of 27 percent. And uh, Mr. McGuire said that farmers would no longer face the false choice of having to choose between a larger retirement package by selling to a stranger or a massive tax bill because they sold to a family member. So the the private members bill uh, did pass in Parliament with a bipartisan vote of 199 to 128 but it was mostly along party lines and most liberals voted against the bill, including agricultural minister, Marie-Claude Bibeau. I find it a bit disappointing that an agricultural minister in Canada would vote against something to help farmers. Um, water, so we all hear how much water Canada has of the global supply, uh, like 6.5% of the world's fresh water, but only 40% of that is available in the south, which is where most people live. And of our fresh surface water, 70% of it flows north to the high Arctic and Hudson's Bay, again, where there are not very many people. In 2009, the Council of Canadian Academies warned that groundwater serving 10, over 10 million people was threatened by rampant urbanization, industrialization, and intense agriculture. That's um, 13 years ago now, and things, as you know, have not gotten better in terms of land use and population growth. And the Great Lakes Basin is also in trouble. It's home to, the basin is home to 40 million North Americans and is experiencing serious and worsening degradation from urbanization, climate change, and invasive species. And I don't know how further population growth is going to help that. Um, loss of wildlife and biodiversity. So every time I give a talk or I mention um, the Committee on Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada's numbers, they go a little bit higher. So now we're at 810 um, endangered wildlife species in, in some category of risk. Uh, they're listed there. Unfortunately, the number of extinct species has not increased from 19. Birds are taking a beating 87 species out of the 460 that you find in Canada at some time of year are at risk. And a lot of um, the populations of a lot of bird species have plummeted by quite a bit. If you're a bird watcher, you, you might have noticed that. And also um, the wetlands, 70% um, of wetlands have been lost to agriculture and development in the southern parts of Canada and where there's dense populations up to 95%. Um, so meanwhile, for people, housing has become unaffordable for many. In May of 2021, an Oxford economic study said Vancouver, Toronto, and Hamilton were the top three least affordable cities in North America. Well, think about that. The U.S. has nine, about nine times Canada's population, yet the top three are Canadian cities. And there's five Canadian cities in the top ten. I heard on a news report, uh, CBC News report, that Canada needs 5.8 million new homes by 2030 to tackle affordability. But at current rates of construction, there will be 2.3 million new homes by 2030. So what if we didn't increase our population by 40 million, by four, by four million between now and then? That would alleviate the housing crisis a little bit. Um, oh, I got that. All right. 
this is a picture uh, uh, I got from the website of Canadians for a Sustainable Society. It shows the greater Toronto area between 1984. Oh, well, one first picture is 1984. And the second one is 2020. And you can see how the sprawl has spread uh, from, from the lake, from Lake Ontario is spreading northwards ever more. So growth has not solved any problems in terms of city infrastructure, traffic, pollution, social services, crime, or anything else I can think of. Whoops, that was right. Um, and then we ask, what metrics do we use to show that a growing population actually increases the quality of life? I don't know of any. The GDP has grown, but not the per capita GDP. Happiness levels do not increase in a big city. In fact, they're happier in smaller or mid-sized towns. Housing has become less affordable. Access to nature has been reduced. Debt levels are much higher. Equality levels are much lower and job quality has declined. So I kind of sometimes think that we're trying to turn our cities into John Calhoun's <laughs> mouse utopia. Uh, for several decades um, in the last century, starting in the 40s, um, John Calhoun built these structures for rodents, first rats and then mice, and had everything they needed in terms of food and water. But as their populations became denser, the, uh, basically they stopped breeding and eventually their populations collapsed. There, there were aberrations in behavior. Um, there's uh, sometimes increased aggressions or mothers would abandon their young. And it, it was all apparently a, a stress response. Now I know we're not rodents, but I think that we can also suffer from the stress of intensive living. But there's still lots of space in Canada, right? Um, everyone has heard of the 49th parallel, the, but it really only applies to the West because then um, Ontario takes a uh -huh. deep dive to the South. So 72% of Canadians live south of the 49th parallel and 50% of them actually live below this red line that you see here, um, which is a bit of Maine sticking into it. Um, that Below that red line, of course, includes the greater Toronto area and all of Southern Ontario. It includes Ottawa and Montreal. Um, and that's how we get, even though we don't have Vancouver and Calgary and other large cities, we still have half of Canada's population living south of that line. So when people say there's lots of space in Canada, it's true, but it's not really where a lot of people live. So as Joni Mitchell says, you don't know what you've got till it's gone and we're busy making things be gone. Okay, but what about the need to grow the economy? And how often have we heard without immigration, our economy would not grow and there wouldn't be increase in the number of jobs and so on. So the answer is, so what? Per capita wealth has not increased, but social inequality has greatly increased. Um, young Canadians face a job churn. That's what Bill Morneau, the former finance minister said. In fact, he said it in 2017, uh, pretty close to the time when uh, immigration minister Ahmed Hussein was announcing the new normal for massively increased immigration into the 300,000s. So my question is, why add to the competition? Mainstream economists, Herb Grubel and Patrick Grady, and by mainstream, I mean they didn't even consider things like loss of farmland or loss of access to nature, but just pure, pure money-wise. Um, they calculated that recent immigrants cost the government 30 to 35 billion more in benefits than they pay in taxes each year. Uh, that was for 2015 or 2014, I think it was 2014, um, because their earnings are lower than the average, but they receive the same or more government services. For instance, they, they'll have language training services or other, other programs to give them a leg up in Canada. So in spite of that, um, they, they, they don't catch up within you know, a decade or so. So Canadian data on the lack of economic benefits from mass immigration is corroborated by a 2008 report by the British House of Lords Select Committee on Immigration that said the impact on per capita income was very small, whether positive or negative, but that the strain on public services and housing 
was substantial. And the arguments for mass immigration have been debunked um, in other ways. We need immigration to keep our population from aging. But several large studies have shown that immigration has no effect on Canada's age structure. Two of the major ones are the one by the C.D. Howe Institute in 2006, no elixir of youth. Immigration cannot keep Canada young. And one by um, Statistics Canada in 2007, projected population size and age structure for Canada and provinces with and without international migration. And both studies show that there is not much impact on the age structure of Canada through immigration. Furthermore, the OECD predicts that Canada will be the worst performing advanced economy over the next decade and the three decades after that. According to David Williams of the Bus Business Council of BC, who said young Canadians face a long period of stagnating average real incomes that will last most of their working lives. Well, that's encouraging. And he also refers to the record immigration levels to turbocharge population growth and housing demands in major cities as a shaky pillar for Ottawa's growth strategy. So, which raises the question, why does the government want to raise immigration levels so radically? Because there really, it really has not shown, been shown to have any benefits to the working Canadian population. But Immigration Minister Sean Fraser says Canada needs to increase immigration to help its economy recover from COVID and to drive future growth. And he is quoted as saying, if we're not ready to significantly increase our ambition when it comes to immigration, we are going to be in a position where our economy will suffer and it could put into jeopardy so many of the public services and social supports that make me very proud to be Canadian. So I guess he hasn't been in an emergency waiting room recently. In other words, more growth will solve problems that it has only exacerbated in the past. So should we actually believe Immigration Minister Fraser when he says that COVID is the reason for the massive increase in the level of immigration? Or is COVID a pretext for implementing a pre-existing plan? So back in 2017, when Immigration Minister Hussein introduced the new normal of immigration levels in the 300,000s, some thought that was not enough. And one group that didn't think it was enough was the Liberal Appointed Advisory Council on Economic Growth, which was headed by Dominic Barton, who advocated for 450,000 per year. So that would have been up at the time from 250,000 to, he wanted to go to 450,000. The Advisory Council on Economic Growth was first announced by then immigration uh, finance minister, Bill Morneau, to the Toronto Regional Board of Trade at the end of December 2015. Bill Morneau, who used the term job churn for young Canadians. So that was announced 2015 and Dominic Barton, a couple of months later, was appointed as chair in February 2016. And another member of the 14 member council was Mark Wiseman. Back in 2011, Barton and Wiseman had co-founded the Century Initiative and Wiseman is its current chairman. Um, so Trudeau's immigration policy seems to be directed by the Century Initiative, not officially, but in fact. So the Century Initiative, its whole raison d'etre when it was founded was to have, it, it want to, to get Canada a population of 100 million by 2100. So it advocates and pushes for a population of 100 million by 2100, from which it gets help, for, for example, from the Globe and Mail, which hosts events for it, where various speakers promote this wonderful idea. And what reasons does it give? And these are actually the reasons that the Century Initiative gives for Canada having such a huge population. It will increase the GDP, so more, more growth for the sake of growth. 
um, Canada will play a bigger role on the world stage. Uh, it seems like a size envy problem because small developed countries are more influential than larger overpopulated ones. And it will counter an aging population. And we've seen that studies show that is not true. Most immigrants are adult and family reunification brings in a lot of older people. And Canada's age structure has not been changed by 30 years of mass immigration. So the Century Initiative wants to massively increase Canada's population through immigration, even though the environmental impact is evident. The stress on city infrastructure and social services is evident. Housing has become unaffordable, even at current levels of immigration. There is no indication that Canadians want to increase immigration. Mass immigration has not benefited working Canadians economically. And there's already a backlog of about 1.8 million applications to immigrate. So it doesn't seem much point in adding to that. As it happens, both Century Initiative co-founders, Dominic Barton and Mark Wiseman, are members of the World Economic Forum. And there are links there where you can go and learn all about them. I copied and pasted a little bit of, uh, of the, their biographies that are found there. That one. So what is the World Economic Forum? So this is from a, a pamphlet online pamphlet that the World Economic Forum put out about itself. So it's an international organization founded in 1971 by Klaus Schwab, and it engages business, political, academic, and other leaders to shape global, regional, and industry agendas throughout the world. And it makes its contribution to global governance through organizations um, such as the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations, and the World Trade Organization. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau, Finance Minister Christian Freeland, and a lot of other Canadian cabinet members are associated with the World Economic Forum. Uh, you can read about them at those links. In fact, Christia Freeland was made a WEF trustee a couple of years ago. And Marie-Claude Bibo, the agriculture minister, is also a, a WEFer, as is Francois-Philippe Champagne of the, um, the immigration minister, Bill Morneau, the former finance minister, and Patty Hadju, who had several portfolios, including health. Now she is Minister of Indigenous Affairs. So a reasonable question to me is, um, you know, is Trudeau's cabinet compliant with the World Economic Forum? Its founder, Klaus Schwab, thinks so. Um, you can find this quotation, which is worth reading at the links below. The first one is just that two minute segment. The others give the whole lecture that he, he was giving or the whole interview, which was at Harvard Kennedy School of Government um, back in 2017. And he said, I have to say when I mention names like Mrs. Merkel, even Vladimir Putin and so on, they have all been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. But what we are really proud of now with a young generation like, Ms. like Prime Minister Trudeau, President of Argentina and so on, is that we penetrate the cabinets so yesterday I was at a reception for Prime Minister Trudeau, and I know that half of his cabinet, or even more than half of his cabinet, are actually young global, global leaders of the World Economic Forum. So Klaus Schwab is boasting about his influence, the World Economic Forum, on foreign leaders. Is there evidence that Trudeau is a globalist? Well, in a 2015 interview, shortly after he was elected, Trudeau told the New York Times that Canada was the first post-national state and there is no core identity, no mainstream in Canada. There are shared values, openness, respect, compassion, willingness to work hard, to be there for each other, to search for equality and justice. So in spite of those shared values, it seems that there is no core identity and no mainstream. I suspect a lot of Canadians would disagree with that, but 
Um, Canada played a leading role in creating the UN's Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. It was one of the originally of the original 13 champion countries to promote the compact before it was signed by a lot of countries in December of 2018. And on June 4th, 2020, it accepted the invitation by the Organization for Migration to become a champion country for it. The language of the compact blurs the distinction between refugees and those seeking economic opportunity. Non-citizens illegally entering a country can receive many of the benefits of citizens under that compact. Receiving countries are to condemn and counter manifestations of xenophobia and related intolerance, which would you know, include anyone who questions this compact. And receiving countries are to sensitize and educate media professionals on migration related, related issues and terminology and stop allocation of funding to media outlets that promote intolerance, xenophobia, racism, and other forms of discrimination. The way I read that is governments are to try to cut, freeze out media that um, don't tow the narrative line on this global compact. And then there is the famous or infamous Welcome to Canada tweet that um, Trudeau sent out on January 28, uh, 2017, not long after the so-called uh, Muslim man of, by Trump, which is actually a misnomer. But anyway, Trudeau sent out this tweet to those fleeing persecution, terror, and war. Canadians will welcome you, regardless of your faith. Diversity is our strength, hashtag welcome to Canada. So raises the question, was that irresponsible or was it deliberate? Um, the tweet did cause an influx of refugee inquiries and it caused a lot of confusion within the government. So that was, it. he sent the tweet out on January 28th um, of 2017 and between February and June of 2021, February 2017 and June 2021, there were over 59,000 irregular border crossers into Canada, also known as illegal, illegal aliens in old terminology. And most of them crossed at Roxham Road between New York State and Quebec. The, Rock, the Roxham Road, boor, um, Road border was a decommissioned, actually a decommissioned crossing point. And that crossing point, which had been closed for decades, was allegedly also closed when the U.S.-Canada border closed in the middle of 2021, um, uh, but then opened again at the end of November 2021. And between November 2021 and March 2022, another 8,000 asylum seekers have arrived through Roxham Road and are probably continuing to arrive. So just from those numbers, we have close to 7,000 people who have illegally entered Canada following that tweet. And as far as I can tell, the government is not terribly worried about it. Um, Trudeau, who, speaking of the, still talking about the globalist subject, doesn't seem to think very highly of people other than our Aboriginals who have roots in Canada. On the eve of Canada's sesquicentennial in 2017, he told immigrants that he is jealous of them because they chose Canada. Anytime I meet people who got to make a deliberate choice, whose parents chose Canada, I'm jealous because I think being able to choose it rather than being Canadian by default is an amazing statement of attach attachment to Canada. You chose this country. This is your country more than it is for others because we take it for granted. I say, speak for yourself, buddy. This, he's saying this country belongs to someone fresh off the plane more than it belongs to someone whose grandfather fought and possibly died in the First or Second World War. But, and Trudeau is also forgiving of violence if the target is old Canada. Following the discovery of presumed graves on the site of a former um, Indian residential school in Kamloops, BC, and then other residential schools, at least 68 churches were vandalized or burned. As far as I know, there has 
been no one has been arrested for this. I mean, I'd love to be wrong, but I don't think the authorities are being very diligent in pursuing who was behind this. And at a news conference on July 2nd, 2021, Trudeau said, it is unacceptable and wrong that acts of vandalism and arson, arson are being seen across the country, including against Catholic churches. I understand the anger that's out there against the federal government, against institutions like the Catholic church. It is real and it's fully understandable given the shameful history that we are all becoming more and more aware of and engaging ourselves to do better as Canadians. Trudeau canceled Canada Day celebrations that year and flew the flag at half mast on federal buildings for five months. Even though the unmarked graves were known to exist and one of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report released in 2015 was to look for them. In fact, that's exactly what was happening when they were discovered. So it really wasn't a surprise to discover unmarked graves, um, which were first hyped as a, as a genocide, in fact. Um, you probably remember that. But I, I would say that Trudeau attempted to very much hype this incident. Um, so, Trudeau's government is also funding a booklet that calls Canada's red ensign a hate symbol. The booklet was created by the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, which is an offshoot of the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center, it was, and was founded in 2018 um, with some startup money actually from the SPLC and also the government, the Canadian government. So this booklet was funded by a $268,000 grant and um, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network had earlier received an identical grant to operate its website. So the government has given over half a million dollars to this anti-hate group, so-called anti-hate group. The booklet says the red ensign denotes a desire to return to Canada's demographics before 1967 when it was predominantly white. And its usage in modern times is an indicator of hate promoting beliefs. It refers to the Conservative Party twice as a group whose members include bigots and groypers, which are identified as a loose collection of young white nationalists. So this suggests a desire to, and this booklet is designed for elementary school children. So I view it as an attempt to erase Canada's history to, and to portray everything about old Canada as horrible and hateful. Um, the red ensign happened to be Canada's flag before the maple leaf became the official flag in 1965. So I think maybe Bertolt Brecht, um, the German poet, had it figured out in his poem of the solution. This is a translation and he's referring to an uprising of East German workers in 1953 in Berlin. So it, the poem goes, after the uprising of the, 14th, of the 17th June, the secretary of the writer's union had leaflets distributed in the Stalin Allee, which is a main thoroughfare, stating that the people had forfeited the confidence of the government and could win it back only by redoubled efforts. Would it not be easier in that case for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? So this is a satirical poem, obviously, but I kind of wonder if uh, Trudeau is trying to dissolve the people and elect another. <laughs> he doesn't seem to like the current people very much. So my hypothesis, uh, Trudeau wants to abolish old Red Ensign Canada and replace it with new globalist Canada. So to test that hypothesis, one could ask what Trudeau would do differently if that is actually what he wanted to do. Um, is there any statement he has made or action he has taken that is pro-Canadian sovereignty or that praises Canada? Is there any statement he has made or action he has taken that is clearly not pro-globalism? Are the population policies of the Canadian government as apparently set by the Century Initiative directed towards advancing an agenda whose primary objective is not the interests of Canadians, but of globalism? And to summarize and conclude, um, Canada has an unofficial population policy, which matches the objectives of the Century Initiative. 
the rapid growth of Canada's population through immigration has no valid economic basis, but is damaging to the environment. The only people benefiting are the profiteers of growth, speculators, developers, bankers who get more mortgages, cheap labor corporations, and politicians. If this growth does indeed turn Canada into a post-national state, it will be easier to globalize it. It would no longer be a country, but simply a market. And finally, is Canada a testing laboratory for the globalist new world order? And that's something for you all to think about. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madeline. Uh, for those of you who are not completely familiar with the choosing of questioners, we like to have uh, a follow up questioner. So I am going to take the first question myself. And the on deck will be a gentleman from Minnesota, I believe, Claude Butner. And he has a comment about uh, immigration. And right after that, there's another comment by John Meyer. So I don't know whether Mr. Butner would like to be on deck, but I will go ahead and ask Madeline my question. And that has to do with the slide in which you showed that over three years, that is two, 2022, 23, and 24, there were about 1.3 additional, as you said, climate changers. Now, I am also familiar, being uh, fairly senior, uh, to uh, with the day when Canada used the point system. Uh, and that's, of course, <clears throat> that corresponded with Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Brian Mulroney. And immigrants were chosen according to Canada's needs. Now, I would point out that, and I don't think this is included anywhere, in your slides, uh, Madeline, and that is that with this, oh, and you, you mentioned, you went on and mentioned that by the end of 2030, if we keep up this rhythm of entry, there will be another 4 million people. Uh, I would point out, but I would like your comment on this, uh, Madeline, that right now we are turning uh, a large number of very low consumers into very high consumers. And that is simply because of the uh, of what, what happens when uh, people who come here from developing countries, this is what happens. So is it fair to say that the world's environment is under greater harm now because of our large uh, population, our large immigration uh, entrance? Well, I would say that the answer is yes. And the environment, the local environment, that is, for example, the GTA is certainly suffering from the impact of um, human population growth in the area. I used to, I, I attended the University of Guelph in the 1970s, and I, I drove from Ottawa, my parents' home, to, to Guelph periodically. And at that time in the 1970s, um, the area around Toronto was a lot of greenery and farmland. There's a lot of farmland. Now, basically, from uh, well, Oshawa or before on, in the east and all the way to Guelph, it's basically one built up megalopolis. Um, so we know where the farmland went. Um, so certainly in terms of local impact, and I had talked about water and farmland and congestion and everything, but from a global, from a, presumably the environment doesn't care who is producing greenhouse gas um, emissions in both Canada and the US, the average immigrant increases greenhouse gas emissions by a factor of four 
because primary contributing countries to Canada, for example, are India, the Philippines, and China, um, and you know you'll have countries like Colombia and, and so on, and they are have all have much much lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions per capita. They have a climate that doesn't require as much heating as is required in Canada, and there's also great distances of transport of, of goods in in Canada. I know a lot of it is north south, but uh, with the U.S., but there is also east east west in Canada. And the other thing is when people. Um, when governments are aware that they, their people can migrate, they might not take measures to solve the problems locally at, at home. For example, the Philippines, Egypt, and Haiti have all exported 10% of their population. So these people are sent out to work in other parts of the world. Uh, they often send remittances back home, which allows business as usual to continue there. Um, and Every country has to take responsibility for its own population. It, it shouldn't expect other countries to be there to accept the, you know, it, its extra population. Um, the other thing is with the point system. I mean, Canada still has the point system, but only about 17% are the, of the newcomers are the primary immigrants. There's, you know, there's the immediate nuclear family. And then there's a lot of um, chain migration. And there's a, a lot of um, family reunification. A lot of people come in through family reunification. So uh, Canada, you know, praises itself about its point system, but it, the, the, the point is <laughs> we don't need a, a massive increase in population. I remember back in the early 2000s, somebody commented about this document that the um, Ontario Association of Foreign Born Engineers or something like that, and it said, we don't need more engineers in Ontario. So even if they're great people, you know, I'm not saying that a lot of the immigrants aren't perfectly wonderful people, but the question is, does the Canadian economy need it? Does the population need to grow? And I would say the answer is no. So I guess that was a slightly long-winded answer to your question, but. <laughs> no, it... well, it, uh, it also shows how linked with many other issues immigration can be. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would like to call upon, and I apologize if I've got your name uh, <clears throat> pronounced wrongly, Mr. Butner, and then John Meyer would be on deck, please. Well, first of all, I'm a non-member and I'm actually from Minnesota, as I put in the chat. Right. <clears throat> So uh, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. And I find it a wonderful organization, especially your YouTube uh, past uh, events. Uh, uh, so, um, Madeline, I, I might be brainwashed because um, I've attended many of the online um, events by Minnesota Africans United, an organization whose uh, website I will put in the chat, uh, which these events are co-sponsored by um, a very long-standing Minnesota um, International Center was the old name, Global Minnesota is the new name. Um, these um, are what I would call the progressive end of the NGO community in Minnesota. And one of the first things I'll just say is that uh, we think that collectively that uh, Africa will be very important. And the immigrants that are here tend to start businesses, which again, maybe I've been brainwashed by the American point of view, but in a way that they start businesses, even if they fail, they start them again. And so they're actually a very robust uh, addition to our economy. And so don't take my word for it. I invite you to look over their website and maybe not the next one or the next one, but they have a, a series that they're going around the African countries. Um, and sometimes people from that country are on, people are making connections. Uh, we have people from SCORE, which is a, uh, an organization of retired executives that help mentor and, and you know, how do you do a business plan so that you can go to a bank and get money? So this, you know, it is a bootstrapping um, uh, requirement on the front end, but we collectively think that it's a very good addition and helps position Minnesota for, um, uh, for the future. And then one more comment, then I'll quit. We actually lost population in the last year, and the two states that gained the fastest were... Um, Florida and Texas. So I don't know if that makes you feel better or worse, but I think that if a climate emergency gets worse and worse, 
you're going to have a lot of people just show up. And they won't be from Somalia. There will be Americans who are just, you know, they're leaving a uh, disaster in the southern part of our country as it becomes unlivable. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are not going to be real obvious who they are. So, so anyway. OK, um, so I, I guess I'll address um, your point. I'm not familiar with your organization, so I, I can't really speak about it from knowledge, but I would, it strikes me that its new name, Global Minnesota, um, reflects a, a globalist attitude and which is a one world open borders, everybody can go where they want, as, same as basically what the global um, compact on safe, orderly and regular migration is promoting. Um, the other thing is I, I I don't know about the hard statistics about um, starting up businesses and all that. I know if, if people start up businesses and they don't make it, we do, we do have a welfare state and I know the US does too. And as um, George Borges, I think it was said, mass immigration and the welfare state don't mix. I mean, back in days of yore, before there was a welfare state, a lot of newcomers to Canada actually left they found out it was friggin' cold. They found out the living on the prairies is no picnic. There's a, a lot of work to do. They go back to the old country. Um, so I we had a program in Canada, uh, the business um, in, entrepreneur program or something, which actually was a failure because basically it brought in a lot of rich people who had already made their money, such as in China, and wanted a safe place to park it. And getting Canadian citizenship was very handy for them. They could educate their kids here. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see some hard data, and I guess I can and look for it on the success of immigrants because the overall data shows that newcomers to Canada are not do not catch up in terms of income for quite quite a long time. And as for Africa, I mean, it is it's many of its countries are still growing rapidly. They are currently at um, over 1.3 billion. They're headed for 2 billion pretty soon and supposedly will be 4 billion by, by 2100. Now, you know, collapse could happen before then, but I see this, this great exodus from, from Africa as, as seeing a, a fleeing, failing economies, um, economic growth has not really kept up with population growth. There is a lot of poverty. People flock to the, the slums and the agricultural land, the, the, well, it's expanding, there's deforestation, but also it's getting cut into smaller and smaller pieces with the number of, of people. I mean, if, if a farmer has five children or five sons and each son gets some, some of it, then the next generation has less. So I, I guess in terms of food needs, because we're we often hear, I mean, we've heard about this, the hunger in the Horn of Africa recently, um, and in also in Madagascar, and all of the countries involved had have had massive increases in population, such as fivefold to sevenfold between 1950 and now. That rate of growth just can't continue. It's we will have to address population growth because no matter how. Um, wonderful a person is, this person still needs food and still produces wastes. And the more people, the more the impact. That is inescapable. Uh, that's my comment. So, um, John Meyer is next with uh, Dave Doherty with a, a number of comments and uh, an exchange with John Meyer. So Dave Doherty is on deck. Uh, John Meyer, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that comparing uh, per capita emissions and uh, uh, and uh, per capita consumption of fossil fuels uh, by country is, is uh, get, gets fairly complex quite quickly. Uh, Richard Unger, you I, I think UBC or uh, Fraser, uh, he. Uh, uh, he did a lot of work on this that uh, I was very happy to find and, and use. And uh, the, uh, uh, if you look at Sweden, uh, which people will say, yeah, you can have a northern country and, and low consumption or uh, CO2 emission levels, uh, the Swedish levels are about a third or less uh, than Canadian levels. But Sweden 
is a net uh, importer of energy. It doesn't export energy. It doesn't produce any fossil fuels. It's also a net importer of food. Uh, and it's one of the most uh, food, the least food self-sufficient uh, countries on the planet. So it, it imports uh, a huge amount of basics, which, which we export. Uh, now, the Swedes are much more advanced than we are in a number of areas, absolutely. Uh, but uh, it, it's very difficult, difficult to compare, but without a doubt, uh, the uh, energy consumption and resource consumption uh, is absolutely higher in Northern uh, countries. And the further North you go, the worse it gets. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, I would add to that, uh, John, uh, being married to a Swede, that we always have to remember the Gulf Stream. And uh, so it has a great moderating effect. So they do not get the bitter cold and the sweltering heat that uh, much of continental Canada gets. So no. I'm sure that enters into it as well. You, you can definitely, though, freeze uh, going from the sauna to the uh, <laughs> water in, uh, in January in northern Sweden, I guarantee you. <laughs> okay. But uh, given the size of Sweden, there wouldn't be, I mean, they don't have the distances of Canada to, to travel. Well, that's right. It's more compact. They, uh, uh, smaller, smaller distances, smaller travel, et cetera, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Dave Doherty and uh, Nick Nickerson just made a brief comment. I'm not sure whether you want to pick up on this, uh, Nick, but anyway, Dave Doherty first with Nick Nickerson on deck. Yeah, I'd like to offer a little bit of a counter perspective. I agree entirely, John, that uh, uh, trying to look at per capita consumption of fossil fuels is an extremely complex thing. I think factors that come into it include not just um, how far away you are from the equator, but the size of the country involved. And that uh, was mentioned a, a few moments ago. On the other hand, it's not as if uh, people in Canada are constantly having to travel to other parts of Canada. If we wanted to behave, for example, like the people in Malta, which has a higher per capita consumption of energy than we do, um, we could, in fact, not travel very far every day. Uh, it's, this is a matter of personal choice and, and collective societal choice. Uh, do you want to go on long holidays? Do you want to take the big road trip? Or if you're in Malta, do you just walk down to the beach? Um, it's very interesting to me to, to look at some data that are in front of me here. We're, we're only, a, if you um, look at recent numbers, and these have been evolving because Canada has actually been um, going down the list in terms of uh, ranking uh, number of um, uh, liters per person used or whatever you want to call it, you know, cubic meters or whatever. Um, but most of the countries that are on this list are in fact far south of us. I'll give you a couple of examples. U.S. Virgin Islands, Singapore, Malta, Saudi Arabia, Luxembourg, uh, the Pharaoh, uh, sorry, not the Pharaohs, uh, Kuwait, um, Bermuda, Aruba, Seychelles, these are all essentially in the tropics. In fact, what's going on is not that we are such a cold country, we have to heat our um, buildings to a much greater extent than other people do, but other people have to cool their buildings even more than we do. So yeah. this is a very complex thing. You can no longer say the further away from the equator you live, the more energy you're going to use. It's just not true. The, the data are right there. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of uh, things built into that. Luxembourg, I think, is coal. Uh, the, uh, and obviously, uh, the, anyone in the Middle East is, uh, is energy production. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, that I, I don't know what about the Seychelles, but maybe they include the uh, the energy used to power return flights of uh, of uh, uh, jets that uh, filled with tourists. Uh, that that's a strong possibility. They can't not include that energy. Uh, so uh, I, I you could modify it a little to say that the extreme temperature extremes, uh, uh, you know, determine uh, to a great extent uh, energy consumption. 
but uh, uh, they, uh, these people, uh, I mean, generally speaking, uh, the, the further north, certainly in Canada, if you look at just Canada, the further north you go, the more energy intensive it is. It, it seems to me that in, in places, like I lived in Pakistan for two years and there were a lot of ceiling fans, which are, you know, produce a bit of cooling, but are less energy intensive than having a furnace going all the time. Yeah. You can survive, or you could back in the 60s, survive in those countries with ceiling fans and stuff like that. Um, you can't really survive in most of habited, inhabited Canada without a furnace. It seems to me that that list you had, Dave, they were all either destinations, as John was saying, you know, it might, they might include the jet fuel to get people back home. So they were all kind of warm weather destinations for people in Canada in the winter, for example, or they were the oil states, which have some very high consumption levels. But I don't know if it was Kuwait or which Gulf state it was, but one of them made a ski ring, like, yeah. so people can go skiing. And I just wondered, I wonder how much energy it took to, to create that and to keep it cold enough sure. for people to actually ski. So I guess if you have a lot of money, a lot of oil money to spend and, and you're a prince or something, you can do things like that, which would exactly. happen. Exactly, it comes back to personal choices. But, you know, I think what the people who want to downplay population is they will say, well, you can, you can do this, you can cut out meat, you can, um, not travel, you can do this, you can do this. And, uh, you know, somebody put it sarcastically, if you want to live just like a little, whatever, church mouse, then, you know, you can do all these things. But the fact is that, um, I mean, it just seems to be part of our nature, people do want to have fun, they do want to do other things. Um, the first thing when China started to develop economically, the first thing that increased was meat consumption, and it's pork consumption level per capita became the same as the US. So the people who were have very, very low um, lifestyles, low energy, low everything lifestyles, it's not because they're virtuous and they want to be doing that. It's because they don't have the opportunity to live in any other way. And I guess the more, the more people there are, the more, more difficult it will be to get a lot of them out of poverty. I think our next speaker may actually um, want to say this, but I'll say it on his behalf and he can reiterate it in a moment. We do have the choice to have more fun and less stuff, uh, you know? Yeah. And, um, and it, indigenous people in Canada did not use the same kinds of levels of fossil fuel that we we're using and they were fine. Right. They had a slightly harsher lifestyle than we did, I would say. I mean, I'm not saying they weren't fine. I'm not saying that the advent of the Europeans was to their benefit because, you know, the, the quality of life has many components. And I think having a sense of identity and knowing who you are and, you know, all this sort of stuff is, um, is important. So yes, it, it is possible. Uh, but I think we would, if we were to go to the lifestyle of the indigenous people, well, for one thing, it's not really possible to keep 39 pil million people going through hunting and, and gathering, I don't think. Yeah, they also died when they were 37. They died quite a lot younger than so. Okay, I'm going to have to uh, um, change uh, Nick Nickerson and uh, Raymond Murphy uh, on deck, please. Hey, it's Mike Nickerson, but we always Hi, been called. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry, Mike. Yeah, yeah. What's the name? Um, we we uh, can heat homes very easily. Uh, with solar energy, just with direct solar, uh, we can set them up so that they're not that hard to heat. The native people didn't spend their time consuming material goods. And we're convinced like the $600 billion, almost a trillion dollars a year spent trying to convince people to buy stuff, which you know, ups our energy consumption. But, but my point that I made in the chat was about the, uh, the mouse experiment that you, you cited. And the Ontario Science Centre has or had a uh, similar experiment ongoing. And what they found is when there was lots of room for the mice to reproduce, they did so effectively. When the nesting boxes were full, then some of them would try in the corners and this and that with varying success. Some of them would eat their babies. But interestingly, homosexuality started to arise. 
making me wonder, you know, as this has become a more prominent factor in our society, whether or not this isn't a natural population control process uh, throughout the uh, material, the mammalian world, perhaps? Yeah, it's, um, that's an interesting question. It's crossed my mind, and I don't know. I also don't know if these various chemicals that are in the environment, you know, the ones that are, frogs are more susceptible, amphibians and, and stuff, but um, the feminizing effect, and um, I don't know. I, I think it's a possibility. It's also, you know, possible that something is is being pushed because um, it is. I I feel they're teaching these sorts of things at a way too young age in in elementary schools, and um, you know everything is age appropriate sort this, of thing. This so would have been in the seventies or eighties that I saw this experiment and read the explanation of what was happening. So mm -hmm. it's not uh, not the sort of modern uh, narrative. Well, the I mean. <laughs> The, they, they, these rats and mice in the Calhoun experiments, they presumably had very high levels of, of corticosterone, which are, or in humans, it's cortisol, but of adrenal hormones, right? They were very, very stressed animals. And I heard this study, I, I haven't sort of um, check, checked its accuracy, but the, the thing is that when Dresden was being bombed, um, the women who gave birth afterwards, their sons were six times more likely to be homosexual than sort of in the normal population. And of course, during a bombing, people presumably were very, very, very stressed. And the adrenal hormones are, are steroids, like the sex hormones. Was there an influence? I don't know. It, it's not an experiment. We can sort of go back and measure levels and stuff. But it, it's possible that that stress um, and the stress of modern living, I just, as I've been living in Ottawa since 1984, um, since I've come back to it. And I have seen how that city has grown massively. Well, I used to be out in the boonies and I find it's more stressful, just something that just the traffic, you constantly have to be paying attention. And now the growth plan for Ottawa is to have 400,000 more people by 2045. And the, and the Century Initiative wants us to have like 6 million people or some ridiculous number. So how, how is that benefiting me? I think people should ask, how is growth benefiting me? And why are they letting the government get away with, with this? Yeah, no, it's crazy. And I, it's an interesting stress to uh, homosexuality connection because it would explain the mouse experiment as well as the others. And, and it's, uh, there are a lot of crazy things happening in big cities around the world. So it's... Uh, you know, the various rages and stuff that happen, or <laughs> like road rage. I mean, every once in a while, I feel like I'm going to get road rage. But <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Uh, uh, Raymond Murphy. And uh, then it gets a little fuzzy in my notes here. John Meyer has a second comment. Uh, and I think uh, Dave Doherty is in there as well. But anyway, Raymond Murphy first. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we can't lose sight of the fact that old Canada was the result of immigration largely by the poor. And we gotta be careful not to want to slam the door shut after entering ourselves. But the real point I wanna make though is uh, following along the lines of people who are talking about uh, personal choice. I think a lot of the problems have to do with uh, the aggregation of personal choices or perhaps we could even call it collective choice. For example, I agree that uh, urban sprawl is a major problem. But that's largely because we have chosen to construct horizontally single family detached homes. That's the personal choice of people rather than constructing vertically like uh, Seoul, South Korea. And I think often po population, I agree. Oops, I'm maybe. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes. You disappeared from my screen. But I agree that personal, uh, population growth is a driver of the climate crisis. And if other things were equal, it would be a big driver. But they're not equal because... I, I would argue that growth of consumption of fossil fuels in particular is a bigger driver. And just to give two examples of that, I, I bet you could find that over the past two decades, population growth in poor countries like Madagascar and Mali has contributed much less emissions than the increase in cruises, jet fuel tourism, private jets, the military, data center traffic, conferences, cremations, et cetera, by the affluent. Let's take China as an example. Its population growth has slowed over the past three decades because of changes like its uh, one child uh, policy. And now its population is decreasing. 
but its emissions have exploded. And by 19, uh, 2021, uh, because 400 million affluent Chinese are now feasting on meat, driving cars, and participating in jet fuel tourism, like the affluent everywhere. So it really is, I come down on the side of personal choices of to consume fossil fuels being a more important driver than population growth per se. Um, well, to address some of those points, um, the first part about, you know, not, not sprawling and, and growing up, not everybody wants to live in rabbit hutches. And part of the attraction of Canada, I think, for a lot of people was its space. The fact that you weren't cheek by jowl with the next person. In fact, I moved out to the boonies back in the day because I, I like space. I, I don't want to be in a crowded city. So by massively increasing immigration without consulting with the Canadian people, the government and, and then says, well, if you guys would be virtuous, um, you would you know, you would live in these crammed apartments for, you know, where you pay a fortune for a little bit of space. Um, so, and a U.S. study has shown that it's mostly population growth in recent, in recent years. It's like about 97% population growth that is driving sprawl rather than houses becoming bigger and, and stuff like that. Um, so, so my question would be, why should population growth be forced on us? Now, about those choices you, you made, I made the same point myself, is that most people, when they have a very low, low consuming lifestyle, aren't doing it by choice. They're doing it because they have no other options. And as I pointed out, and you pointed out, the, you know, the Chinese greatly increased their meat consumption when they started to develop, and then they want more stuff. I mean, I agree with, with Mike that... Um, there's a point where you don't need more stuff and we are being programmed through advertising and stuff that we need more and more stuff. But in a, um, Bill Reese has pointed out that the greatest increase in um, impact in terms of personal consumption is now not the rich countries because they've sort of maxed out. I'm not talking about absolute values, but increase we in the rich countries have pretty much everything we need in terms of food and shelter, even though housing is expensive. But the in the middle income and low income, um, middle low income and middle middle in whatever countries, the middle countries, the increase consumption by poor people as they clamber their way up to the middle class is, is driving an increase in, um, energy use, which is understandable. I mean, it's understandable that people don't want to live in abject poverty. And I think, I think that's only one part of it. I think the other part is the increase in consumption, in particular of fossil fuels by the, by, by the affluent, namely precisely what I said, you know, jet fuel tourism is increasing by affluent people and countries. Private well, jets is, uh, is increasing rapidly. Well, Cruises, yeah. the whole thing, data center traffic, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, you know, I, we have the, the matter of, of these people attending the climate change conference or Davos in, in private jets and stuff like that. I think a lot of people in the formerly rich countries are being kind of forced out of the middle class or not keeping up with these uh, with these changes. And they, they are not helped by the fact that the population is growing. So I think either way, we have to address the fact that 8 billion people is an awful lot of people for a planet to support. And um, the, oh, you mentioned Madagascar. Now I happened to, the, not so long ago, there was this thing about the famine in Madagascar because of the war in the Ukraine. And the Ukraine and Russia are both major producers of wheat and some other grains. And this was having a devastating impact. But what the article didn't say is that Madagascar's population had increased sevenfold since 1950. Now, even though they have a very, 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 very low consumption level compared to us, they are still destroying the soils because where they live through a subsistence agriculture. It was okay when their population was lower, but when you're on an island and your population keeps increasing, or even when you're on a planet and your population keeps increasing, you are gonna run into problems. 
but I live in Ottawa too. And, um, and uh, you can just see in Ottawa, we're destroying an awful lot of farmland because the city keeps expanding. It's uh, become a huge city because we develop horizontally. And, and I you, think uh, uh, affluent countries and affluent people are largely responsible for climate change, rather more so than population growth by poor people and well, poor countries. I anyway, think, that's my point. I think there's a an, an, there all the focus seems to be on climate change, and none of it seems to be on other things that are happening. Like ninety percent of deforestation, actually global deforestation, is due to expansion of agriculture, which is due to population growth. So if we, instead of focusing on climate change, if all we did was focus on deforestation, then we would say, oh my God, we have to do something about population growth, which you know, I think we actually do uh, because we are, have already put under cultivation pretty much all the land that can be cultivated. And our population is still growing. I have uh, down Raymond Lurie, uh, comment having to do and a question having to do with climate refugees and then uh, John Meyer and Dave Doherty both weighing in about globalism and uh, anyway globalism uh, for the moment so let's uh, have Raymond Dari and then John Meyer and Dave Doherty on deck Uh, hi, Madeline. Um, yeah, sorry. So um, um, a few comments as you so so, um, uh, you know, from my perspective, a human is a human is a human, whether they're Canadian or not doesn't matter. And it's clear to me that it's us here in Canada and in the Western world that have created the climate change. We've also uh, created the overpopulation crisis in, in, in Africa by uh, providing health services and providing some uh, agricultural tools that allowed uh, population to increase um, substantially uh, way beyond what the earth is uh, able to to um, uh, to carry and and we've had this discussion before in these forms uh, that we eventually we need to come down to some more reasonable amount of population because we uh, the earth simply doesn't have enough resources for uh, for the number of people we have now that being said um, uh, I, I, I <laughs> Uh, I won't beat around the bush too much here, but it seems to me that your argumentation is that uh, we Canadians are already here, should stay here, and we should leave everybody out of the country and um, and uh, leave them to their fate. So people in Madagascar, uh, someone who was born today, uh, who was a child today, who had no choice but to be born in Madagascar because that's where his or her parents were, uh, that that person should be left to their own device uh, and we should exclude them from immigration in Canada because, uh, hey, they're not here, so uh, they're not important. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and your, your, your discussion about globalism, um, um, I, I, you know, the, the, the um, globalism is a euphemism or, or globalist is a euphemism for some very bad stuff from the the the, the uh, right wing nationalist um, uh, interest group, so um, you know I uh, you know why I'd like I, I struggle to to form a formulate a question here on this, but why would it be a proper decision for the world uh, to exclude people from Canada instead of giving them the opportunity to actually survive in a country where they could get a better lives? And actually, every okay. single thing I've seen in the past is showing me that uh, immigrants contribute more to Canadian economic and cultural life and all that than, uh, than uh, long-time Canadians or old stock Canadians, as some would say. So, um, you well, know, I, what's, go well, ahead. I, I would say that um, your comments show, I suppose that um, propaganda works because we have been told for a very long time that, you know, basically, immigrants do more than native born Canadians. Well, was how was Canada in the 1950s and the 60s? Was it a terrible place? But what I wanted to address is you, you say it's our fault that Africa's population has increased um, approximately tenfold actually since um, 1900 when it was only about hundred million. Um, so yes, healthcare and providing food increased, but uh, uh, sorry, kept people alive. We What we did is we, cut back on the death rate. So there was death control, but birth control never really took off. Now, 
when the population was reasonably stable because deaths match birth and there was a lot of infant mortality and that sort of stuff, a lot of uh, maternal uh, childbirth deaths and this sort of stuff. Um, and then we, you know, stop, cut back on that a lot through better health and nutrition and providing food aid, the population took off. So then the question is, why, why was birth control not, why did they not cut back on the birth rate? The thing is the pronatalist attitudes did not change and there were no, there were programs um, to promote smaller families, but there was no sort of, um, they, they weren't implemented by every government. There was a lot of opposition to them. For instance, by the, the Catholic Church, by the Vatican and the UN, it, it prevented the implementation of family planning programs right from the get-go after the Second World War, when the World Health Organization was being formed, that's first chairman, Brock Chisholm, who was a Canadian, wanted to have family planning programs along with child immunization. And the Vatican got together a group of countries. Catholic yeah, so, okay, 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 but uh, so, okay. Let, let's take a step, let's take a step back here. So, you know, the, the, I, I certainly agree with you that there should be more family planning and all that. And what we found uh, through studies is as, as uh, people's prosperity grows, they tend to have smaller families, which so is actually, a case in Canada. True. That, that is not what happened in Africa. That is the assumption that the demographic transition as it happened in, in Europe would just automatically play out everywhere in the world. And the fact that there are now 1.3 billion Africans shows that they didn't play out everywhere. In no, the, the problem in Africa is they're still very poor, uneducated. The no, women no, are no. not educated. It's, it's, you're putting the cart before the horse. Studies by James O'Sullivan has shown that the countries that became wealthy were the ones that actually started having smaller families. And she, that's, what I, that's what I'm saying. So but, No, but it's so, not that they start became wealthy I'm sorry, it's not that they had smaller families because they became wealthy. It's that they became wealthy because they had smaller families. So it's the other way around. It's countries that actually, she compared, for example, the Thailand with Thailand with the Philippines, which had the same population in 1970. And the Philippines, uh, the Thailand put in a, a family planning program, um, which very successfully uh, reduce the total fertility rate yeah you're talking about fa family planning there so and, and china yes. did the same thing with people who were uneducated and all that and because they enforced it it worked right they were both poor countries but it worked. and they didn't but, enforce it it was okay it was but you didn't answer but you didn't answer my question so if i'm a poor person and i come from a very poor family in canada actually so if i'm a poor person in africa uh should shouldn't canada accept me because okay. as a refugee or okay. as an immigrant I a suggestion i think yeah. you can watch a video by roy beck called the gumball video uh, world poverty population and gumballs and what he shows using gumballs representing each gumball representing one million people is showing the annual increase of like over 80 million people every year well how can he was talking about the u.s but how can the US solve it through immigration? So even if the US, he said, took in, increased its 1 million intake um, of legal immigrants as it was back in 2010 and increased it to 3 million, what impact does that have on the global increase of 80 million? Uh, so many, that, again, again, that's not my question. My question is why would someone uh, that's, that's coming from elsewhere that wants to come to Canada decided that Canada is a place they want to go. Why should we close the door to them? Uh, yeah, is it because, is it because they're from Africa because they weren't born here? Uh, are they are, no, are they not as human? It's because we recognize the limits to growth. And even back in the day when Canada, when most of the immigrants came from Europe, in other words, when race wasn't an issue, immigration levels went up and down. They weren't high all the time. They weren't continuously high the way they are now. The government would cut back, um, for instance, during the depression, it would cut back on immigration when it didn't feel that it needed a lot of immigrants. And right now, then that was in an emptier world than it is now. Now we're in a very um, overpopulated world and we have our own young people struggling to find jobs. Actually, we have an acute labor shortage right now. And it's very hard to, to hire anybody right now. We so we have an acute labor shortage because we're trying to build so many houses because we're bringing in so many people. If you know, they talk about the need for trade. Okay, we do need more people in the trades. But the reason we need more people in the trades is we're we're supposed to be building houses for an extra four million people. I so, used to work in IT, and we need we were we had an acute shortage of qualified, skilled 
uh, labor and IT, and this has been going on for a long time. And we were trying to get people to migrate to Canada to fill that particular gap. So, it, and and that's no different with other. Well, does, does that mean half a million a year? I mean, sure, you can bring in specialists. Sometimes you need specialists, but sometimes it's a matter of training its own people. I remember a few years ago when um, the, there was a big furor in in the U.S. about the IT workers at Disney who were being fired and they were bringing in, they were training people from India. Basically the people who were gonna be fired had to train their cheaper successors from India to do their jobs. So it's great for corporations to bring in this cheap labor, but it's not so great for the quality of jobs in Canada and the people you know, who are already there. And I think the government of Canada, its first obligation is to the people of Canada. That doesn't mean it has to be irresponsible but every country has to be responsible for its own for its own self. Canada cannot solve the problems. Well, Canada cannot solve the fact that Madagascar's population is still rapidly increasing. And so I'll, 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 I'll have to agree to disagree because I see myself as a citizen of the world and every human on the planet has the same value. So every, from my right. perspective, well, anybody's welcome to Canada. Well, you see, I've lived in other parts of the world, and I certainly would not like to live under Pakistani law. I kind of appreciate the law I have now, Canadian law, at least as it used to be, who knows where it's going. But I don't want to live under Sharia law, thank you very much as a woman. Um, if we're going to be a minority in our own country, it won't be, you know, it won't be European enlightenment value setting the, setting the tone or this. Uh, I have one last question. And this has to do with the um, discussion about globalism. And uh, I will say, John Meyer, you have a number of very good comments as well on other things. But let's just say, uh, John, if you could please comment on, on globalism. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. then, and then also, I think this replies to some of um, Madeline's slides near the end. John, you said a well-managed labor shortage can be used to drive strong productivity growth. So if you could please cover both of those, and then uh, I will cut off the questions uh, at a recorded level. So, uh, John, uh, yeah. last, uh, last question. Okay, yeah, just, just on labor shortage. I mean, uh, in Canada, we've thrown labor at, uh, at every uh, conceivable uh, uh, issue. Uh, we've actually brought in strippers uh, because uh, uh, under temporary foreign worker, my, that's my favorite example, uh, under temporary foreign worker uh, 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 program, uh, because Canadian women, for some reason, didn't want to be strippers where 60 or 70 percent of the women are actually involved in prostitution. I don't know why they don't want to sign up. Uh, but hey, there's a business model there. and We've got to keep it going just like uh, temporary foreign workers into uh, uh, Tim Hortons, uh, because, uh, hey, Canadians don't want to work for $9.50 an hour. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the labor shortage we're having now, and it is a labor shortage, uh, the, uh, the guy I, I know who runs a, 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 a brewery here, a brewery restaurant, uh, his people now, he's had a hell of a time getting people. His people now in the service industry are pulling in around 30 bucks an hour. That's almost a living wage. Surely we can't have that. Uh, we want them down at 950 an hour, uh, where we can uh, go in for our cheap meal and, uh, and have these uh, uh, people smile and uh, then go back to their hobbles. We can't have people earning $30 an hour and actually uh, living well. So I, I anyway, that's that's uh, I think with aging, we're on the cusp of a permanent labor shortage, which is the best thing that could possibly happen to this society if we manage it well. Anyway, question. Uh, the, I don't think globalists have anything against Canadians. Uh, I think uh, any growing population uh, that pushes their buttons uh, is going to uh, uh, going to make them happy. So uh, we, the boom generation has failed to produce enough kids, so they don't like us anymore. They were happy when we were booming, uh, the big generation, but they're not happy with us now because we're not having enough kids. 
but uh, anyone who produces and does things that uh, make some money, uh, which is like asset inflation, larger market, they're happy. Uh, so I don't think they've got anything against Canadians. Uh, it's just that we're not uh, uh, turning their crank anymore. Yeah, so basically, um, they're making the choices for us. We made the choice uh, not, you know, to, to stabilize population and with balanced migration, that is emigration equals immigration, um, we'd have stabilized at about 28 million or so. And that's not good enough for them. So they have to drive it. Yeah, I'm not saying that that they don't like Canadians, but they don't like sovereign Canadians where the government can say, no, nope, this is this is what we like. We're not part of this globalist thing. We're we're our own country and we're going to do it our way. They, they don't like that. Yeah. So okay. they need to. Okay. They need I, to have just, it. I, I don't feel threatened. now. OK. <laughs> uh, I would uh, like to now close the formal or recorded questioning and uh, call upon uh, Jean Doherty to thank our speaker. Uh, Jean is the chairman of the board of directors of the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome. Uh, Jean. Thank you, John and Madeline. It's uh, my pleasure and privilege to have the opportunity to thank you for such um, an interesting presentation that you've given. You addressed many elephants in the room and as <laughs> As, as um, evidence from all of the questions and the comments that have been made, you have touched a few nerves and, and I think you've stimulated some thought and discussion that will go on for a long time afterwards. So thank you very much for giving us this presentation today. And uh, for those of you who are not one of our regular um, members, I would encourage you to go to our website, canadiancore.com, where you will be able to find information um, about our um, our organization and if you wish to join us you're welcome to do so and I would encourage you to um, apply for and become part of the stay informed group you don't have to be a member to be getting that because there you will get all the information about new things including the uh, posting of this particular talk and all of our other talks on our YouTube site so please go to our website and um, enjoy and I look forward to seeing some of you again anyway thank you very much Thank you very much, Jean. I enjoyed it. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the to KCOR for inviting me to give this presentation. <laughs>